There's more to imagine when you listen. So let your imagination soar with Audible. Audible has audio titles from every genre that will inspire you to imagine new worlds, possibilities, and ways of thinking. As an Audible member, you get to choose one title a month to keep from their entire catalog. Enjoy an exciting reawakening of a beloved classic with the Audible original, David Copperfield by Charles Dickens, produced by Academy Award-winning director Sam Mendes, starring Shudi Gatwa, Helena Bonham Carter, and Theo James. This adaptation breathes new life into a familiar tale. New members can try Audible free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash imagine or text imagine to 500 500. That's audible.com slash imagine or text imagine to 500 500. Welcome to Money for the Rest of the Personal Finance Show on money, how it works, how to invest in, how to live without worrying about it. I'm your host, David Stein, and today is episode 144. It's titled, Trade Deficits Aren't Bad, Trade Wars Are. The last week, LaPrell and I have been on at a beachfront hotel in Tulum, Mexico. And I don't know how you like to spend your time at the beach, but I just, I'm not much for sunbathing. I just like to have a porch where I can listen and watch the ocean, have some decent Wi-Fi so I can get some work done, put together the monthly investment conditions report for Money for the Rest of Us Hub members last week. So we objectively looked at where are we in terms of valuations, economic trends, market internals at the, of the beginning of February. But I also observe what's going around, uh, going on around me. And one of those things is every day about 7 a.m., there's three or four workers that go out at this hotel and rake the seaweed and garbage that washed ashore overnight. And I mean garbage in the literal sense. There is a conveyor belt of trash that floats along the prevailing ocean currents until it washes up on the Mexican coast. Now, the beach where we're at, it's very well maintained, but if you walk a stretch of beach that isn't constantly cared for, such as just south of here is the Shan Khan Biosphere, you will find water bottles, motor oil containers, paint cans, shoes, toys, Coke bottles, cups, and bowls from Jamaica, Haiti, Puerto Rico, Honduras, and the Dominican Republic. I know this because five years ago when I stayed here, I, I surveyed. We were in the middle of the Shan Khan, and I looked to see where much of this trash is coming from. Now, some of it is from Mexico, but the vast majority is from Caribbean nations as it floats ashore. Now, five years ago when I stayed here, there was one groundskeeper who spent all day raking up the debris and loading it in a wheelbarrow and then taking it to a hole he had dug on the beach where he dumped it. And if you go to the show notes for this episode, I'll have linked to a video and you can watch this this happening. This was five years ago. Today, though, there are, as I mentioned, three to five workers, and the task only takes about 30 minutes because instead of loading the debris into wheelbarrows, they pile it on the truck bed of a John Deere Gator all-terrain vehicle. Then a groundskeeper drives the John Deere to a far-off lot, and, he, and then he dumps it. Now, here's the question. When the hotel purchased the John Deere Gator all-terrain vehicle that was manufactured in Horican, Wisconsin, did that help or hurt the Mexican economy? What about the U.S. economy? Peter Navarro, an economics professor at University of California at Irvine, he's the head of President Trump's newly formed White House National Trade Council. And he would argue the sale of the John Deere ATV hurt Mexicans' economy and helped the U.S. Now, now maybe you wouldn't argue that. I'm, I'm basing this on his analysis of Trump's economic plan. This is back from September 2016, before he was appointed. And here's what he wrote in, in that economic plan. Quote, when net exports are negative, that is, when a country runs a trade deficit by importing more than it exports, this subtracts from growth. So he would say a trade deficit, when you import something, that that subtracts from economic growth. So it hurts the economy. He's basing his analysis on an accounting identity that is used by government statisticians to estimate gross domestic product, and GDP, 
That measures the monetary value of a country's output in terms of its production of goods and services. And it's so it's what's produced, the output. But the way that they calculate that, and I've, I've mentioned this in numerous episodes of the show, is they can look at what was spent and they can look at the, the amount of income earned. But the formula, this accounting identity for calculating GDP based on what was spent, it's consumption, so by households, investment by businesses, what are they investing in terms of buildings, new equipment, it's government spending, and it's exports, what's sold to foreign countries or businesses or households in foreign countries, and then it backs out imports. So it's consumption plus investment plus government spending plus exports minus imports. Now, the idea is that by backing out imports, that is where we're sort of looking at that. So that reduces economic growth. But in reality, if somebody buys an import, a household, me, that actually is already showing up in consumption. And so by backing out imports, we're taking it out of consumption. And why are we doing that? Because GDP is a measure of what a country produces. And by definition, an import is not something a country produces. It's something a foreign country produces. And so in calculating the level of output or GDP, we want to back out that that import. So when John Deere produced and sold the ATV to the Mexican hotel, it indeed, indeed boost the U.S. economy because it was an export per the accounting identity. And so it was additive. But from Mexico's perspective, importing the ATV didn't automatically hurt the Mexican economy. The purchase of the ATV would have been reflected in GDP as consumption or perhaps as an investment by the hotel. But the accounting identity, as I mentioned, subtracts out the ATV import to offset the fact it was included in the consumption and or investment. So in other words, the formula neutralizes the import purchase so that it has no impact on GDP whatsoever. And again, that's because the accounting identity is there to estimate the amount of goods and services produced domestically. So imports don't automatically subtract from GDP growth. But it's a little more nuanced than that. If the hotel bought the John Deere instead of a suitable replacement ATV that was made in Mexico, then the John Deere purchase would indeed have hurt the Mexican economy because it was substituted. Otherwise, they would have bought an Italica, which is a, a ATV brand that I hadn't even heard of that, that's made in Mexico. I'm not sure if they make something like a Gator, but if they didn't buy the Italica and instead bought the John Deere, that would have hurt the economy. But if there wasn't a suitable Mexican-made replacement, then the hotel might not have purchased an ATV at all. In that case, the workers would have been less productive. They would be back to just raking and having a wheelbarrow. And so the seaweed would stay on the beach longer. And if it stays too long, it starts to smell. That potentially would discourage guests from returning to the hotel, or they might leave a negative review. That, in turn, could lower occupancy at the hotel, which would hurt Mexico's economy because GDP would be reduced by the lower amount of hotel services that were exported to nationals visiting Mexico. Because when you when you take a vacation to a foreign country, that really counts as exports because you're you're the visitor and they're exporting services to you. Here is how Noah Smith, he's a Bloomberg columnist and assistant professor at Stony Brook University, describes his concepts. He writes, if I buy a Japanese made laptop, does that mean I decide not to buy one made in the U.S. If Intel buys a German-made machine tool, does that mean it chooses not to buy a different tool made domestically? The answers to these questions will determine how trade affects the economy. If imports substitute for domestic-made goods and services, then reducing trade deficits really might boost the economy, not via the simple accounting fallacy described above, which is the, the formula I just gave you, but by boosting domestic producers. If I'm substituting and I buy a foreign good instead of one made in the U.S., that does have a negative impact on the economy. He goes on, though, but if imports are complements to U.S. production, 
then trade restrictions could backfire severely. Foreign-made parts are often essential to U.S. manufacturing. Foreign call centers and other business services help many U.S. businesses concentrate on doing what they do best. Foreign-made industrial tools are essential for many U.S. manufacturers. If these imports prove very expensive to replace with domestic equivalents, then trade restrictions could create huge costs for many American businesses, forcing those businesses to be less profitable, shrink, or shut. Another professor, Michael Pettis, he is a professor of finance at Peking University in uh, Guangha School of Management. This is in China. He says a higher trade deficit doesn't have to make the United States poorer. It can make the country poorer, but it can also make the country richer. Trade deficits can sometimes lead to higher growth and lower unemployment and sometimes lead to growth and higher unemployment. The same is true of trade surpluses. It turns out that whether the the United States is richer, that is more productive or poorer, depends on whether whether what causes the deficit also causes productive investment to rise. By buying a good and import that increases a business productivity, that potentially can't help the economy. And he talks about this idea of what causes a trade deficit. And we typically think of trade deficits being caused by a country having more competitive goods or, or, or they're cheaper for some reason, so people buy them, or they're not available in the particular country. Later in the show, we're going to see that that's not always the case. But historically, it has been, especially when the world was under their gold standard. And a great example is it was I found it in the book by Stephen Johnson. It's called Wonderland. And he talked about how in the 1600s, the Northern Europeans dressed themselves in thick, scratchy garments, undergarments made of wool and linen because cotton was only produced or primarily produced in, in India. Johnson writes, after thousands of years of experimentation, Indian dyers located on Coromandel Coast established an elaborate system of soaking vibrant dyes like matter and indigo into fabric, employing lemon juice, goat urine, camel excrement, and metallic salts. Most colored fabrics in Europe would lose their pigment after a few washes, but the Indian fabrics called chintz and calico retained their colors indefinitely. Going into the 1600s, the the wealthy started using this cotton for drapes and curtains and decorating their houses. But then some of the more, the, some of the women started cutting down the curtains to make dresses and cotton undergarments, and demand for this chintz and calico skyrocketed. The East India Company went from bringing in a quarter of million, importing a quarter million pieces in 1664, pieces of cotton, to 1.7 million 20 years later. Now, this got the native sheep farmers and wolf manufacturers very worried. They, they were worried about losing business. And this was actually became a moral issue. Johnson writes, hundreds if not thousands of pamphlets and essays were published, many of them denouncing calico madams whose scandalous taste for cotton was undermining the British economy. Finally, Parliament issued a ban in 1700 on imported dyed calico. And in 1720, they banned it altogether. They were seeking to protect the, the wool and linen industry. Now, I found a a fascinating academic paper by Stephen Broadberry, and it looks like he was the primary author, and Bishnupriya Gupta, and it was titled Cotton Textiles and the Great Divergence. And I'll link to that in the show notes, or if you remember my insider's guide, I already sent you the links to the video I'm talking about, the, the particular articles. And and a summary article that week's episode, and you can sign up for that at moneyfortherestofus.net, or if you're a U.S.-based listener, you can get this free weekly email by texting the word INSIDER to the number 44222. Well, this paper pointed out that higher silver wages, silver wages in Britain, because Britain was very highly productive in other tradable goods and services, meant that Britain couldn't replicate what India could do in terms of cotton. It just was too, took too long and it would have been too expensive. And as a result, India earned a little more than 20% of the English unskilled ways. Wait, so much less earned in India. So they had a competitive 
advantage. And and there was this huge demand, and so there was a trade, uh, imp, basically a trade deficit relative to India. And because they were on the gold standard, that potentially could result in a flow of gold leaving Britain. If those in India that had a claim, had British pounds, for example, could potentially, if they showed up in England, get gold for that and exchange it at a bank. But India had a definite advantage. And, and, and that was sort of this bilateral trade. But what happened then was the British cotton industry ultimately became more productive. They invented, and that the lack of the competitive advantage spurred them to develop some labor-saving technology to, to sort of offset the wages. They were able to, example, there is the Lewis Paul spinning machine invented in 1738 and John Kay's flying shuttle. And, throw, and so through advanced productivity techniques, eventually things shifted and England became had a competitive advantage relative to India in the production of cotton. Now, it certainly helped that by then the New World was established and there was some slavery so they could bring cotton in that way. But this this idea of trade, ultimately, the, the paper found that the protective measures taken didn't really help the tariffs. People got around and they said they're right. Indeed, it, it becomes possible to argue that protection in the domestic market was, if anything, likely to delay the shift of competitive advantage by removing the immediate pressure on basically Britain to develop a more productive way to to grow or not to grow cotton, but to to dye it and produce it. They eventually got there. They became more productive, but it wasn't because of the tariffs. But the point is the trade deficit between the UK and India in the 1600s was due to India's competitive advantage or competitive advantage in producing cotton. So it was a price advantage. But that's not always the reason, as we'll see after the break, for trade deficits. We have to see what's on the other side of the trade, what's on the other side of the seesaw. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. In my profession, I've seen how critical it is to have the right candidate, both to interview and ultimately to hire. And that's where LinkedIn can help. LinkedIn isn't just a job board. LinkedIn helps you hire professionals you can't find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively searching for a new job, but might be open to the perfect role. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. So hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash David. That's linkedin.com slash David to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Sometimes it's just nice to sit back, relax, maybe even take a nap. That's not what you want your money to be doing. You want it to be working hard for you, earning interest, generating returns. That's where the Betterment Automated Investing and Savings app can help. Betterment's technology gives you advanced tools that are built to help you maximize returns. They have diversified portfolios of low-cost ETFs that have been constructed by experts. High-yield cash accounts, where your money can earn 11 times the national average. And automated investing technology, like automated rebalancing. These tools can help you reach your savings and investing goals. Betterment is a fiduciary. That means it's their job to act in your best interest. They will never recommend an investment or give you guidance unless they believe it will help you reach your financial goals. So visit Betterment.com to get started. Learn more about the high-yield cash accounts at Betterment.com. Investing involves risk, performance not guaranteed, cash reserves offered through Betterment LLC and Betterment Securities. Betterment is not a bank. A few weeks ago, LaPro and I were driving from Merida and Yucatan down to Campeche, the city of Campeche. And we, about halfway there, we passed a town. It was called Pamuch. And we didn't, the, the highway didn't go right through town. But on the, on the side of the highway, we noticed a number of what are called panaderias. So they're, they're bakeries that, break, that bake 
pan dulce. It's a type of sweet bread that that many Mexicans eat in the evening for for dinner with coffee or hot chocolate. And so that was unusual to see so many panaderias in one, one, one stretch. And so about the fourth one, I stopped because I had a bathroom there. And while the pro was in the bathroom, I asked the baker, the guy working the counter, he says, well, there's a lot of panaderias around here. What, 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 why is that? And he, he says, it's our job. <laughs> it's the work. It's a living. That's why, because that's what we do. And, and so I, then I try to rephrase my question. He says, well, is there something special about the bread in Pamuch versus in, in somewhere else? He said, not really. About the same. And then I, I said, well, is it, I notice it's bigger than, than like you get in Merida. And he said, yep. So I bought some. And it was really good. So when I researched on the internet, I found out that it was good because it was made in it wood wood burned ovens lined with brick, and and the ovens actually have glass in them. And somehow, they're just very very good bread. But the question is, well, how, where did I get the money for the bread? I'm down in Mexico. I use pesos, and and by being a foreign citizen buying bread, technically that's an export to me. But what's on the other side of the trade? I had to get those pesos, and I got those pesos from an ATM, a Banamex ATM that gave me pesos, and so they took the money from my bank account in dollars, and so there was a transfer of dollars from my account to Banamex, who owned the ATM, who now has those dollars and gave me the pesos. That transfer is part of what's called the capital account. There's, and this can be really complicated. There's something called the balance of payment. And it's another formula. It basically says the current account, which makes, which is basically primarily trade, trade. So it's, it's the trade deficits. It's the exports minus the imports. That's what's known as the current account. Now they add in some income transfers such as interest uh, on investment, but it's primarily a goods and services. So that's called the current account. But on the other side of that, to balance it out, there's a capital account. And what that measures is it's investment. It's the change in foreign ownership of domestic assets minus the domestic ownership of foreign assets. In other words, what does another country or collectively, so China, How much investment are they making in the U.S. with the dollars they've gotten from running a a trade surplus with the U.S.? By selling more goods to the U.S. than China received back in imports, they have excess dollars. Those dollars, we haven't used it. I've talked about this in other episodes, but that's called the capital account. And it capital account also includes other investments, which are capital flows into bank accounts from, from loans. And central bank reserves and changes in that. So it's it's the money side of trade. And so a trade deficit, when a country rents a trade deficit, it has to be offset by a capital account surplus. In other words, a country that runs, that is importing more than they're exporting, that means that there's a country on the other side of trade or multiple countries on the other side of the trade that they are investing capital in getting more wealth in the U.S. because they have the dollars to do that. And this is accounting entity or this is accounting identity. It's just the way it works. And it can be somewhat confusing. But Pettis writes, we tend to assume that countries run trade surpluses or deficits because of relative price differentials on traded goods or because of other trade-related factors. And that was the example I gave of India and Britain and cotton and calico. We assume that the United States runs a trade deficit with China, in other words, because goods produced in China reflect fundamental differences in cost structures in the two countries. We think about the capital account at all. We assume the capital account adjusts to whatever level is needed to balance the trade account. Put differently, trade flows are assumed to have primacy, and capital flows are assumed to adjust the balance of trade flows. While this may be true in some cases, and probably was true for much of modern history, it is not necessarily true today, at least for large economies like the United States. What he is saying is that a country that runs a trade deficit, 
the, if they run a trade deficit, there has to be a capital account surplus. In other, in other, another country or countries collectively are investing more in the U.S. than the U.S. is investing in other countries or its citizens. But he's saying we usually think, well, that's because of the trade deficit. That what's caused it. But that's not always the case. And oftentimes it's caused by a desire of other countries to invest in in the U.S. In other words, the, the capital account surplus, capital flows into the U.S. is forcing the U.S. into a trade deficit situation. It's the capital coming in that causes the trade deficit. And the mechanism is often through the through exchange rates. So as more money comes in, then the dollar strengthens, other currencies weaken, and imports become more attractive to households in the U.S. and to buy them. And so it's not always the, tr- the trade that is causing the trade deficit. It can be the capital flowing in to the country. And so when something, somebody like the Trump administration said trade deficit is always bad, and our, it's like whack-a-mole. They're trying to hit a trade deficit and solve that problem when, in fact, the problem might be over here. It might be the capital account. Why is money coming in to the U.S.? And a great example was during the Great Recession. We talked about this in, I forget the episode now, but it's called The Great Financial Crisis or What Caused It. And in that episode, we talked about the these mortgage-backed securities and collateralized debt obligation and how all this capital was coming into the U.S. so they could get this supposedly low-risk exposure to high-yielding assets. That caused capital to flow in housing prices to boom, and contributed to the U.S. trade deficit. It was the capital coming in that caused it because a the balance of payment, this accounting identity, says a trade deficit must be offset by a capital account surplus. The money coming in can cause trade deficit. We see this in Mexico. Mexico ran a current account deficit, about 2.8% of GDP. That means, as Pettis says, Mexico is importing excess global savings rather than contributing to the U.S. capital account surplus. In other words, the Mexico is ultimately, collectively, is running a current account deficit. And so when the Trump administration is trying to beat up Mexico or, or potentially threaten to pose tariffs, renegotiate NAFTA, etc., that potentially could make things worse for the U.S. because if Mexico's trade deficit with the world narrows, that means the amount of money coming in on the capital side, investment into Mexico, would also narrow. And that money could then actually be diverted to the U.S., so more capital flowing into U.S. instead of to Mexico, and that would expand the U.S. trade deficit and make things worse. It's like whack-a-mole. You hit one, but you get somewhere else. And so you cannot address a trade deficit only. You have to look at the capital. Where is, why is the capital coming in? If a country such as emerging markets, Mexico, is running a trade deficit and the capital is being used for productive investments that actually make the economy more productive, then that's actually a good thing. The trade deficit's a good thing for Mexico if the capital going in is in longer-term investments that helps Mexico become more productive, which means the citizens are going to earn more income, which means their cost, they're, they're basically going to become more wealthy. So a trade deficit could be a good thing. But if a trade deficit occurs because capital is flowing into a country and buying mortgage-backed securities – that were structured in a way that there was fraud involved and it was disinvest or investment that should never have happened and causes a bubble, bubble, then that's a bad thing. And so we can't just look at trade deficits and say they're good or bad. We have to look at the total equation. What's on the other side? Why is capital flowing into the, into the country? Is capital flowing in to offset a trade deficit so it's being driven by the trade deficit itself? Or is the trade deficit being driven by the, the capital flows. And so starting a trade war is bad. Trade wars start because of misunderstandings. And misunderstanding can start with something as basic as how trade work. And if you ignore the other side of the trade and the capital flows, the capital count, 
That is not the place to start. And so that does concern me regarding the Trump administration. Now, maybe they have a more nuanced view. They actually know this. This is all preposterous. And, and I'm not completely – free trade doesn't always have to be free trade all the time. We, we learned about trade back in – I think it was episode 108, Can You Win at Trade? And, and listen to that and learn more about trade. But maybe NAFTA does need to be renegotiated. But we have to do it with an understanding of how trade works. At this point, if you've listened to this episode, you know more about trade than many people because you know trade deficits are not always bad. Sometimes they could be good if the trade deficit is offset by productive investment in a country that helps them become more efficient at making bread and making other things and allows their GDP to grow faster because of those investments. So that's episode 144. You can get show notes at moneyfortherestofus.net. Everything I've shared with you in this episode has been general, for general education only. I've not considered your specific risk profile. I've not provided investment advice, simply general education on money, investing in the economy. Have a great week. <laughs>